All right, you can see the video I have planned for today. The Avondale Mine Disaster Site. Been a lot of videos done on this, but I have a special connection with this mine. And I'll explain why when we get to what's left of the Avondale Colliery Site. So this is right off of Route 11. And you can park here. It is a park that is for the public. So I'm just going to dub over this because it was so windy and traffic was crazy. And plus I had my daughter with me. So this is the access point to the trail leading to the remnants of the coal breaker itself. Only three tenths of a mile away. Real easy walk. So there's where we came from. And this is the actual remnants of the collar itself. And again, this was the old rail bed where the breaker itself loaded the coal into the coal hopper cars and they sent it out to market all across the country and even Canada. I have my infant daughter with me, so I have to film one-handed. So if you hear a baby goo-gooing, it is not me, I promise. Huh, I'm sorry, animals up there. They did a really nice job with this park. This was overgrown, full of trash. People still occasionally come down here and fill it up with trash, which is deplorable. But, man, they did a really great job. Kudos to them. <laughs> so here would have once been the heart of the colliery. So on September 6, 1869, this now peaceful site was a huge fireball, and unfortunately 110 people would lose their lives underground. What makes this even more upsetting is this was just an accident waiting to happen that could have been avoided because there was only one way in and out of the mine itself, which was a vertical haulage shaft that was connected to the wooden breaker itself. So if something happened to the breaker, such as a fire, they were screwed. Pretty neat that they put two pieces of rail here where there was existing ties that were most likely original to the colliery. I know those rails weren't there, but those ties are probably there. So it gives you an idea as to what the site once looked like. I'm standing right in the heart of the old loading area for the coal coming from the breaker itself and this is pretty neat too it's a shame that the breaker is gone but here's the original steel i-beams and they were cut when they destroyed the breaker cool little visual representation however it's really nice that they put these little benches and stuff and it makes it like a little park really nice in the summertime you can see these individually stacked rocks they might be from the first colliery that burned down but definitely from the second one that was built after the fire it's still holding strong well until 2023 and it's cool that they recently erected a uh, handrail on those poured concrete Stairs gives a little bit of life to the site, brings it back from the past, especially since it's been torn down, unfortunately, the breaker that is. Looking up, there's the drift entrance that we're going to go up to soon near the American flag. And just up beyond that is the remnants of the vertical haulage shaft. Feel free to pause over 
these pieces of paper if you want to read more about the disaster itself. They do a good job presenting the story of, unfortunately, what happened that day. And there's a photo of the second rebuilt breaker. And the shaft head frame of the second colliery looks just like the first one that burned, which is pretty creepy. Literally, it looks like a carbon copy. Again, that's from February 1910. There is a artist's rendition of what it looked like on September 6, 1869. And again, that's right before our involvement in World War I, the l and Railroad. And there's the powerhouse. Remnants of the rail for the coal loading area. And there's the main retaining wall for the Avondale breaker itself. Drift is right there, shaft is right up there. So I got lucky a number of years ago and was able to get this original 1867-1868 stereo view. And they just offset these two photos slightly and you would view this image on a stereo view viewer and it would give a 3D effect to the photo, which is absolutely amazing. Even for today, it's just a cool concept and it's fun looking at these old breakers because they literally come to life. Now, this was the Avondale breaker that caught fire. And right here is the shaft head frame housing that was literally connected to the breaker, as you can see. And the shaft went vertically down to compartment shaft into the red ash fan. And I'll show what a stereo view viewer looks like. So this is a stereo view viewer. And you would hold on to it with one hand on that handle. Center bottom. Never mind the TV remote. I'm just propping that up because it wants to fall off the couch. And you'd place the stereo view like that. Center mass against that piece of wood and you would push the stereo view either outward or inward till your eyes focused and it gives a perfect 3d image so we'll see if we can replicate that on um, video here i doubt it but we'll see there's no way to get the 3d effect with a cell phone you need two eyes and that's just not going to happen obviously with a cell phone but it still looks kind of cool looking through the left eye portion of the stereo view viewer. So again, that is the Steuben shaft head frame. This is the Avondale Steuben vertical haulage shaft, two compartment that went vertically down about 240 foot to 327 feet into the red ash vein. I didn't climb up there to check, but I don't know if the two compartments were in the foreground where I'm pointing to right now, or more on the other side of that other wall right underneath the American flag. Regardless, this vertical haulage shaft is in fact backfilled properly and not a danger to the public. So on that fateful day, around 7 o'clock in the morning, the entire day shift and multiple shaft cage trips worked their way from the surface down into the red ash workings. And they had recently just come off a three-month-long strike. Little did they know that none of them would ever see the light of day again. Unfortunately for them, their fates were sealed long before they even stepped on that vertical haulage cage on that fateful day. This breaker was a 
ticking time bomb, and so was the mine as a whole. There were so many things working against those poor guys that day. There was only one way in and out of the mine, which was vertical in nature. It was attached to a huge wooden structure that had many operating machine parts that required oiling them for lubrication, which increased the flammability of the structure itself. Plus, the breaker had tons and tons of coal dust in it, which is extremely flammable. And also, there was lots of actual coal reserves in the coal chutes. So that just was a bomb waiting to go off if there was some sort of ignition source. Another thing that completely worked against these gentlemen that day was the fact that the mine was ventilated via a furnace that burned anthracite coal at the base of the vertical shaft. One compartment was dedicated to upcasting the air, which would circulate the mine air. So as the hot exhaust from that furnace was leaving the shaft, fresh air was being forced through physics down the shaft, thus providing the coal mine with fresh air from the outside. The issue was this, flammability. The shaft was physically lined with wooden boards to prevent rocks from breaking off and falling down the vertical haulage shaft. So if something happened to that furnace or the chimney flew, and some embers escaped, there was going to be an issue. So back to what's on the screen currently. On that no trespassing sign, those wooden supports are parts of the old head frame to the vertical haulage shaft. This would be the rebuilt one, not the burned down one. So that was just part of the structural integrity of the superstructure that lowered the cages up and also down the shaft itself. The use of burning coal in a furnace to ventilate mine air was banned in England 10 years prior to the Avondale shaft fire. Fortunately for the victims of the Avondale colliery, American authorities did not adopt such a policy similar to England. So the miners working underground for the most part were strike breakers brought in from Scranton and they were Welsh Protestant miners and they had made a separate series of negotiations during the strike with the coal company and the Irish Catholics were left out of those negotiations and were understandably very upset um, upon hearing this. So just fresh off of a three month long bitter strike and strike breakers are brought in and the breaker catches fire. Hmm. A lot of people think it may have been arson and I do not think that is such a far-fetched theory. Officially, the accident is blamed on wooden beams such as this one I'm pointing to that would have lined the actual internal shaft from top to bottom and that was just to prevent rockfall from killing people going up and down the cages. So the furnace at the bottom of the shaft that was ventilating the mine somehow malfunctioned via the flue and sparks caught the wooden lined shaft bratis on fire, it became an inferno. It roars up the shaft, burning the wood wall of the shaft in a sense, catches the head frame superstructure to the shaft on fire because that's connected to the breaker itself. Now the breaker's in Inferno. And again, this is the only way in and out of the coal mine at the time. Now you're looking at a drift entrance and you will see historically speaking drawings from that day where the dead were being brought out of a tunnel. This was an old exploratory tunnel where they were just looking for the coal seam I think it was back in the 1850s, it predated the 1867 breaker construction. And just by chance encounter, this was an abandoned old drift that just happened to cut through where the Steuben shaft would later be sunk. So roughly three hours after first getting underground, the fire breaks out and the men underground probably would have heard the head frame 
crashing down and making all types of noise because it was imploding from the fire intensity. Because there were no alternative air shafts or other mine openings whatsoever, the air underground was quickly being consumed by the raging breaker fire and shaft head frame fire. Not only was the oxygen being sucked out of the mine via the upcast through the shaft, but unfortunately, the combustion of the breaker was downcasting carbon monoxide and other deadly gases into the mine workings. So the miners would have retreated to several chambers and built bratis walls, and that was just wooden boards, in a sense, acting as a door in an attempt to keep good oxygen in that immediate vicinity and to prevent carbon monoxide from entering their chamber. They would have taken off their clothing and stuck their clothing in the cracks of the wooden boards to make it airtight. Unfortunately, it didn't work for them. So think of it like this. It would have looked like a hallway in a sense, and there would have been wooden beams going horizontally, most likely, um, from top to bottom with clothing stuck in the cracks of the wooden boards to try to keep out the bad air. So back to this abandoned drift that predated the shaft and again also intersected the shaft. I was reading a book back in college, uh, I think like 2008, 2009, and I think it was from 2004, the book. And it talked about how this drift, you could like still see it. And I was like, no way. So I went there and I saw it and I was like, whoa, when I crawled in and right there, see that backfill, it looks like a little mound. That is the old Stuben shaft that has been backfilled from the top all the way down to the bottom. And you can get past that and you can go through that back doorway. So I was like, wow, this is great. We went in there, you know, it's like 2010, 11, 12. And unfortunately, it looked like there were signs of satanic rituals. There was a naked Barbie doll. There was some sort of animal skull. The whole mine section smelled like human urine. I don't know what was going on, but I was just disgusted by that. So that's when I decided to call the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and have a back gate placed on this because I knew this was going to be backfilled and it would most likely be filled with concrete. No one would ever get to see any remnants of, you know, the actual mine itself. So in a sense, I preserve this. I know it was not a popular thing that I did. There's a lot of people are upset by that, but I'm not going to have some weirdos, and let's face it, there are weirdos doing, you know, weird ritualistic stuff down there. They're desecrating a site where 110 people died, and I wasn't going to let that happen on my watch. So I'm very happy that the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection preserved this site in a sense by placing a back gate on it. They did a really good job too by making it match the back wall. It almost looks natural. It's really cool. Please feel free to pause at any time during this video when you see these pieces of paper and you can read it for yourself. So back to the disaster. Unfortunately, there was two 10-year-olds according to this historical kiosk and the one little boy, Willie Hatton, died in his father's arms. Thomas Hatton. Now, apparently he was pestering his father for quite some time to let him come down and see what it was like in uh, working anthracite coal mine. And the father did not want him to go down because he knew it was dangerous. And unfortunately for that little boy, that day that the father finally gave in to his son was the day of the fire. Very sad. You can see that there were 14-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 19-year-olds, just a tragic calamity. What I found completely disgusting about this event was the media. For whatever reason, I guess to sell more newspapers through sensationalism, 
they were somehow, for whatever reason, granted access to the bodies of all of the victims and had detailed reports as to where they were found in the mine. And more importantly, they outlined in graphic detail every physical appearance of how this person died. Some people died extremely violently from asphyxiation. Um, they were bleeding from their eyes. They were bleeding from their mouth. They were vomiting blood, coughing up blood. Again, because they were, you know, trying to um, breathe and they couldn't. So they were popping blood vessels. And it was just disgusting that the media of the day was allowed to publish this. Um, some people died peacefully, but a lot did not, and they let that be known to the world. Completely pitiful and very shameful. Disgusting. These poor guys didn't even have any privacy in death. Literally every death pose was illustrated for the world to read. They would be like, oh, this guy died in a praying pose, and then he was in a pool of his own blood. Just very, very upsetting. So I was able to replicate a scene from roughly three days after the fire when they were recovering the bodies on September 9, 1869, and the backgated drift that exists on the site today looked like that during the disaster. And again, that was the old abandoned exploratory drift, and they put a derrick with a hoist over the shaft void and they put the bodies on a platform and raised them up the shaft and then in the drift they had people bring out the bodies now initially after the fire transpired there was a huge crowd that gathered on the breaker site and they thought people still might be able to survive underground so they had to wait until the flames died down and very heroically a man by the name of Charles Varchu was sent down the shaft and he saw that the shaft was blocked with beams from the breaker and the shaft head frame itself. So he took care of those blockages and then he came back up. Now, two more rescuers went down. Charles Jones and Stephen Evans went down. They noticed dead mules in the mine gangway off of the bottom of the shaft, and they noticed that there was closed doors, and again, it was part of that bradicing. So they banged on those doors, and then they heard nothing, and they left. And on their way back up, they cleared more debris for more mine rescuers to go down. Unfortunately, all 108 people that entered that mine that day were already dead. Now, the rescuers did not know this, so they were trying very heroically to find signs of life. And the last two rescuers to go into the mine that day were Thomas Williams and David Jones. They very bravely were lowered down the vertical haulage shaft on a makeshift platform. Once they got off of the platform at the bottom, they would have pushed into the gangway and uh, attempted to get into the workings to look for their friends and co-workers. And unfortunately, they were asphyxiated themselves by black damp. And once the authorities found out how horrendous the black damp buildup was, they surmised that no one could have possibly survived down there. And they made the call to transition from a rescue operation to, unfortunately, a recovery operation. The fallout from this event was tremendous. A lot of historians say that this ushered in the Molly Maguire era. The miners were sick and tired of horrible working conditions, safety-wise. They were tired of being treated like animals, and in most cases, the mules were even treated better than they were. So the 1870s decade that was coming in just a few months after this disaster was an extremely violent one, historically speaking. And again, the mythological Molly Maguires, I don't think they ever existed, um, to be honest. Uh, the violence of that time period was on the horizon. 
and it was extremely violent. A lot of arsons, a lot of murders, a lot of chaos in the coal fields. This event really motivated the men to push for unionization. And the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s were very violent. Unfortunately, the coal operators did not want a union, and they fought back very hardly with their coal and iron police. Often, the state militia was brought out to suppress riots. Tons and tons of mayhem in the coal fields, and it culminated in 1902, the Great Strike, and the formation of the Union. February and the grass is growing. Amazing. Again, this is the lamp house that was built after the 1869 fire. And this was for handing out flame safety lamps that would detect black damp and methane in the mine air. And also, this was the place where you would get your mine tag for checking in and out of the mine. And that was just a way of them keeping track as to who was underground and if they had to go look for you. So after the disaster, there was 72 widows and 158 fatherless children. And there were a few instances where these men had just come over from Wales and they didn't even have a chance to bring their families over yet. So they left um, widows over in Wales and they never had a chance to even come to the United States. Very tragic, all the way around. Not long after this calamity, Pennsylvania was the first state to make a safety regulation that required all the mines in its territory to have at least two entrances to prevent a similar occurrence from happening again. Unfortunately, the Avondale Colliery was not alone with single event high casualty numbers. One other such event was the Baltimore tunnel disaster of June 1919 in the east end section of Wilkes-Barre, right behind the present day Home Depot, just a few hundred feet into the mine. A massive explosion tore apart the man trip car, carrying over 100 men, and unfortunately killing over 90. Overall, during the historical anthracite era of mining, 36,000 people are believed to have died violently, and that is not including, most likely, several hundred thousand to black lung disease, also known as anthracylicosis. So, historically speaking, the anthracite coal fields were akin to a war zone. Not a safe job to have. Many have heard about the Avondale, the Baltimore, the Knox coal mine disaster. But there were so many events where three died here, seven died here, ten died there, one died here, two died there. It quickly added up to that 36,000 number. And we often overlook the overall casualty rate when we focus in on single events such as Avondale. And the Avondale needs to be remembered, but we should not forget overall that the anthracite era was a very bloody one now i don't know where i read this i think it was in that book that was written on the disaster and it talked about the drift entrance which you know ultimately led me to the site and ultimately also led me to getting that bat gate installed on it but there was an account somewhere i tried googling it and i couldn't find it but i know i read it in print um and it was a reliable source that there was a deathbed confession that an arsonist had started the fire and he did not mean to kill all the people underground and he was just mad at the uh, coal company don't forget that they had separate negotiations between the welsh 
and the coal company and the Irish and the coal company and that the Welsh were brought in as strike breakers, essentially. And there was only eight Catholics killed in this disaster. And for the most part, the Catholics were not present that day at work. So, I mean, <laughs> historically speaking, also, the Irish Catholics were hated by the Welsh. So there's a lot of animosity there. A ton. So there's a lot of motive for arson. If someone is confessing on their deathbed, I mean, wouldn't you believe them? Why would they do that if they weren't guilty of that deed that they were confessing? So we'll never know. But what an interesting little bit of forgotten history that is. I bumped into another YouTuber here, which is pretty cool. He was flying a drone. You'll see it here in a sec. Is that cool? Remnants of the boiler house, also known as the steam plant. They would have burned their own coal that they mined. Mm. So this is that back gated entrance. That is the exploratory drift that predated the Avondale Colliery itself. And it just so happened to coincidentally intersect the vertical Stuben shaft. And this is where they brought out the bodies, unfortunately. You can see this guy here weeping over the loss of his friend. Really graphic, awful stuff. All the other co-workers looking on. And this is the remnants of the burned down breaker and shaft head frame that was connected. This is from one of the newspapers. And it just shows how graphic they were in the 1860s. The caption is, the Avondale Colliery disaster, friends claiming they're dead. And I didn't want to show the other images because they're just kind of too graphic, I think. They were talking about how they were getting the bodies ready for embalming. There was one, literally, of all the bodies in the mine chamber um, as they were found by the recovery teams. So literally, they just drew all the dead bodies, uh, children. You know, it's just, it's graphic. So I'm going to admit that. Very upsetting, though. If you go to my channel homepage, you'll see this image up top. And what's absolutely bizarre about this is this guy looks just like me if I don't have my glasses on. He's got the same build, same hair, same beard. Even looks like the same nose. I mean, it's weird. Eyebrows. So I guess there I am as a time traveler looking at one of the unfortunate deceased souls. For real, though, anyone that knows me will probably agree that that looks like me. I showed my wife and she was like, Woo. Bizarre. Very bizarre. I have this authentic 1875 document penned by a man with the last name Stores. And 
This is from the Susquehanna Coal Company. Pretty sure this is the same stores that oversaw the Avondale Breaker. I don't know if he was just the boss or if he was the owner, but he's some sort of bigwig. Because here, less than six years after the Avondale Fire, he's talking to one of his competitors about fixing the price of coal being shipped out. So yeah, that wouldn't be uh, kosher today, I believe. They would often get together these rival rail companies and coal companies and set prices. They were a cabal. I don't think this guy lost any sleep over the 110 guys that died in 1869. Life was cheap back then. Labor, they were disposable. They were seen as robots in a sense, less than human. Very sad. This is one of the most interesting things I have in my coal collection. This is a check from a relief fund that was sent to, I assume, one of the widows. Looks like her name may be Mary. It's hard to make out those old school cursive letters. But as you can see right here, it says the Avondale Relief Fund office Plymouth Pennsylvania and it's dated March 7 1874 and the Avondale disaster was one of the first global relief funds that raised money via the entire planet so interesting little bit of information that is and you can see her signature from where she endorsed the check So I just had to check the fatality list, and in fact, her husband's name was Dennis Guyton, and the pencil is pointing to that last name, G-U-Y-T-O-N. So, another sad piece of history documented, and it should be documented. So hopefully you like this video. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to drop a comment. Thank you so much for viewing this. See ya.